Right, today is a first for me. I have never preached ever a full message on finances, ever. Okay? My heart is just to bless people, right? Let's say first of all, I am after nobody's money. I'm after your heart, oh God. Okay? But uh, especially when we went to Miami, the Holy Spirit really challenged me to begin talking more about money in church. And I'll just say for a start, um, I've been turned off in the past by stuff in this area. But who believes that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater? That's right. Amen? Amen. Should we just get offended and then turn off to what the Word of God actually has to say? You know, I know, I know of a church in Leeds and outside it says, we do not take collections. Well, we don't take collections here either because this is not a collection. Okay, it's an act of worship. And actually, to, to not teach on finances is to deny the people of God blessing, isn't it? Amen. Because I tell you what, God's will is that we'll be blessed. Amen. Amen? Now, when, when I mention the word finances, and people's faces go, Ooh, let's, let's brighten up a bit. This is good news. This is good news. Right? And when I say things like, God wants you blessed financially, just... Like, hear this as if you've never heard this before. Okay? Now, there's uh, we can get turned off when we can think this, oh, so-and-so's got a big private jet of 65, oh, I don't know how many million dollars, they bless him? I wouldn't mind one. <laughs> yeah. um, and I remember years ago, right, I was, at, we used to be in a church that was in a, ex like, kind of a real holiness, right, and self-denial. And even believing that it could be God's will to make you sick to keep you humble. And that was God's will to be poor. And you know what I had? I was sick and I was poor. I had rheumatism in all my joints and I had Crohn's disease and I was broke as well. And there's a lot more I could say about all that. But God's will is that we be in health and prosper even as our soul prospers. You know, and even if you, you sat there and you think, well, I'm, I'm kind of doing okay. But we need to get on to God's plan, not just do okay. God has big plans for our life. And I'm not you know, bringing this like a, a better you type of thing. It's all a self-centered spiritual consumer thing. Because this is how the gospel prevails in society. Okay? Do you realize cities like, like Sheffield was once the center of the steel industry? And who, you know, I'm going to say who remembers, who knows, back in history, this country was the main gospel sending country in the world. Who owned the steel industry? Born again Christians. Okay? It was Christians back then when this country was the main gospel sending country who had the wealth. Well, Christians. And now there's other religions come in and they take the wealth. You know? And so something has to change. And in our lives, it's like we, we can't be anointed. We can't, we can't live in the anointing if we're poor. Because the anointing the, um, you know, is to bring good news to the poor. It's just so they're not poor anymore. Okay? So, and, and it starts with getting the, the yoke and the mentality of it broken off your life. And what does it mean to live a life where we're blessed and where we're enriched. This is why we're not living in fear at all. We're not living dependent on, on the government. We're not anxious about who do we owe. We're able to live self-sufficient with more than enough. You know, when we're able to bless the kids, we're able to do just life and have more than enough to bless others, to sow, to give. Okay, so that's God's will. In the kingdom of God, there is no poverty. You know, we'll see, well, blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. The word poor means to be without any resources whatsoever, to be helpless. Now, those disciples, in a sense, weren't, in a way, poor, because they could have just gone back to their fishing business. Notice I said fishing business. These guys were not thickos. Jesus didn't call a bunch of thickos. He called businessmen, self-employed guys. They owned boats and nets. That wasn't cheap. But he said, blessed are you poor because in this, he's blessed are you poor in spirit. A person who knows they've got nothing of themselves. They've come to a point where I've got nothing of myself to produce any fruit in life. I'm now at a place to receive the kingdom. Glory. And when we receive the kingdom, we're not poor. 
There's no, there's no poverty in the kingdom because the king's dominion. You know, if Queen Elizabeth was to come to Leeds, do you think she's just going to come like you know on the National Express? You know, do you think she's going to thumb a lift up the M1? And then she's going to, you know, get dropped off at the services now and get a bus from Wakefield or somewhere like that in Leeds. No, she's going to, she's going to be, she's royalty, mm. right? She's going to come to Leeds, she's going to, all the entourage, because there's royalty. You know, she's a queen, if there was a king coming, they, wherever the dominion of the king is, there's, they can't, they can't, they just can't be poverty and lack when the kingdom of God takes ground in our life. It's impossible. There's no poverty in the kingdom. There's no lack in the kingdom. Oh, but have you been to Africa? I've been to Africa eight times and I know people in Africa. Personally know them. No, I know someone who's never had a salary for 35 years. Never had a paycheck for 35 years living by faith. He doesn't even know what he's going to put on the table that night. They just have to pray. It's crazy, he lives in the biggest house in Nakuru, Kenya. Nakuru is the fastest grown town in Africa. And he's got one of the biggest houses on the highest hill. And, and yet he lives by faith. He doesn't have any disposable income. He has no wage. And he has loads of orphans to take care of. And, and, and all of his own stuff. And yet all of his kids, his daughter is the top academic in the whole continent of Africa. At the University of Cape Town. All of his kids, he's, they've gone to university, everything. He doesn't know how he did it. I've got a good friend in Dar es Salaam, she's got no salary. I've got other friends, got, and, and, and you look at their lives. I'm sat down with some men of God in Uganda the other year. And as you do when you're with other men, you talk about your kids. Oh yeah, my kids, my kids. And they're talking about their kids and some more. And yeah, and I've got 70 orphans that I'm responsible for. And you're like, right, I'll just um, shut up and listen now. <laughs> You know, and the 70 orphans, and they need this, and they need that, and we took them in off the streets, and there were nothing, and they see them all the way through the university. Amen. By faith. By faith. And you think, yeah, someone has to give the donations. Yeah, but by faith, by faith, and operating in faith, in faith, sowing and reaping. It's amazing. Amen. Hallelujah. Do you know what the Bible says in Genesis 8.22? It says, while the earth remains. Now are we going to believe the Bible? Mm -hmm. It says, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. Is the earth still here? Is anyone here on planet earth yes. right now? While the earth remains, seed time and harvest. Okay, while the earth re remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer. Are we in summer now? All the seasons still happening. So seed time and harvest is an immutable principle. Okay, what we sow, we reap. Can we just believe that? That is Bible truth. Jesus said in Luke six thirty eight. Here he is, the words of the Master: "Give, and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put back into you." So. How much comes back to us depends on what? How much we give out. How much we sow depends on how much we reap. But with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. So there's a law of sowing and reaping. Now for some of us this is basic stuff. Again in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 8.6 says, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. Amen. So sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. It's there, isn't it? For good or for bad. And in every area of our life. Some people say, I need love. Well, so love. Go and love some people. I need, I need love in this church. I don't, well, we'll give some love then. Sow some love. Galatians 6, 7, this sounds quite a tough one. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he reap. And if you look at the specific context of Galatians 6, it is in the context of giving finances. It's almost saying like, look, there's people are hearing the word and they're disengaging from the fact and thinking, oh, you know, and it says, look, those who sow to the spirit reap life. Those who sow to the flesh reap corruption. Well, how in that context of Galatians 6, because it's in the context of wherever you're receiving spiritual food, sow into it. So Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. So if I'm going to sit in a church, 
If I'm going to be part of a ministry, I want to know that there's words of spirit and life coming forth. Because I ain't going to sow into it if there's not. Because I'm not going to get a harvest. I want to know that God is moving in that ministry. Okay, Jesus said, look, the words that I speak, I don't speak on my own, but the Father in me does the works. Right? If there's no supernatural manifestation of God in a ministry, God is not speaking in it. End of. Positive motivational messages might be great, but if, if there's no supernatural manifestation, God is not speaking. Full stop. So if God's speaking in a place, and there's words of spirit and life, we soak to the spirit. Because it's easy, people think, and Paul, in this context, well, I just disengage from this. I don't have to. And by doing that, they're trusting in the arm of flesh. They're sowing to the flesh, not sowing to the spirit that has been. Because Second Corinthians three says that he says, "Look, we've been made ministers of the new covenant of the spirit and not of the letter." So when you come to church, if you're coming to a living church, you're coming to a place where the spirit has been ministered to you. Words of spirit and life, where spirit has been ministered to you, where people are receiving the fire of God, people are receiving healing, and you walk away, you've received spirit and light. So he's so with There's a partnership there. And it says, look, communicate with... It says in the King James in Galatians 6, it says, communicate with those who preach the word. And that word communicate means partnership. Yeah. That's what it means. It means partnership. So there's a shared grace. I'm just... This is Bible stuff, okay? This is biblical stuff. I know that when we've seen people come into this ministry and, and you know, there's no great... No, Jesus said, where our treasure is, where our heart is, is where our treasure is. And it just is. Where our treasure is, where our finances go, shows where our heart goes. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I've seen it again and again, when people put their heart in to a ministry and put their treasure in, boom, I see it. I see so many changes in their lives. Amen. I see literally within a month it's like, they've got new jobs, promotions, it's because the partnerships happened. And it's like, it's so important, guys, that you find the right ministry, the right place in the body for you. Years ago, when we were in our church wilderness years, right? Me and Fiona were in a church for many years. God called us out. We checked out various places. We went to uh, um, a believing, I say a believing, a believing Anglican church. It was great. And I said, look, if we, if we put a tithe here, where will the finances go? Will it stay in this church? Oh, no, it'll go to the diocese. Sorry, bye. I'm not, not against people, but I'm not putting my seed into that ground. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting it into the Anglican Diocese for Yorkshire. Because there's other things that they're, that they're doing. That is completely ungodly. And money is a seed, it's spiritual. And I ain't sown it there. That was sad, I thought it was quite a nice place. But I can't be part of a place unless I'm going to sow there. It's a spiritual principle. Yeah. Sorry, bye. It's, it's, it's important. Right? Hallelujah. Second Corinthians nine. From the amplified. Say amplified. amplified. From the amplified translation. Verse seven. It says, Let each one give as he has made up his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God loves, say God loves. God loves. He takes pleasure in and prizes above other things. He is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyous giver whose heart is in his given. So when we're free in our heart, and our heart's in our given, the Word of God says God's unwilling to do without you. God loves that. When, we, when our heart is in our given, that's why if we have a collection mentality, well, this is for the collection. Now forget it. Please don't. Don't. Keep it. We don't want it. This is an act of worship. It is holy to God. And when our heart is in it, it's the grace of God. Wow. Hallelujah. And then it says, And God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance, so that you may always, and under all circumstances, apart from when there's a recession on, Apart from when the economy is bad and on the news, woo, when on BBC and Sky News they're saying that jobs are being cut. God is able to bless you apart from when the, the economy is bad, apart from say the stock market's crash, God's not able then. So anyway, all 
all circumstances, right? So whatever's going on in the world, it says God is able. Doesn't matter. Even if we're in the middle of a world war, right? And it was crazy. It says God is able in any circumstances to make all grace and favor abound to you. Amen. You hear a lot about grace, and I love the grace of God. But in the context of here, there are levels of grace and favor that get released to people. It says God is able to make all grace. So it means it's, it, that favor is there in potential. How do we release the potential? We give him some seed to work with. As the same Oral Roberts used to say, if you've got a need, plant a seed. I know a brother, a great man of God, and God told him, right, you get, I'm going to give you a building. You know, instead of saving loads of money up for it, they just start sowing and sowing and sowing and sowing everywhere. And that's what we're going to have to do. Amen. God spoke to me about a month ago, I felt the Spirit of God say, you're going to have to start giving away some money. Okay, and we just had a need come in recently about um, a man of God we know in Kenya whose brother died, leaving a widow and some orphans, okay? That's not good in a place in Africa. So we just had to sow there from our church bank account, from our own personal account, just to make sure that widow, place to stay, kids are gone to school, everything's cool, everything's stored, okay? We've got to, we've got to sow, right? We've got to give, because this isn't about a get rich for me sort of thing. Okay, this is about kingdom. God's will is that we're self-sufficient. We don't need to be reliant on this on the system to keep us going. Amen. And it goes on to say, and God provides seed. Who gives us our seed? Where does our seed come from? It comes from God. It doesn't come from our paycheck. We might go we might think we earn it. No. We need to realize our money is not ours. We're stewards. And the fact that we have a job and we have the health and the well way to do it, it's all the grace of God anyway. So He provides seed for the sower and bread for eating. He multiplies your resources for sowing. So we don't, you know, we need to make sure we don't eat all of our seed, right? We need to sow it. God is able to increase favor in all of our lives. In the area of business, self-employment, career, finances. He is able. Under all circumstances, if everyone in your company is being laid off, it doesn't matter to God. He's able. But we've got to act. Are we saying oh, we've got to buy the blessing of God? No, God forbid. But we have to act on faith. Faith demands an action. And there's a lot in this passage about the heart. The heart has to be right. And we've just done a series on the heart. And there's nothing shows where our heart is at than where our finances go. I'm just preaching to myself as well. And in a way, I'd, I want to be more... Who wants to be completely free from Babylon? Who wants to never worry about finances? I don't mean don't be irresponsible. We've got to be wise. And, and just not to worry about it. Just to be completely no when the need's there. You're living in the economy. Say the economy. Of the kingdom of God. You're living in God's economy, not the Babylonian economy. Praise God. I mean, if, you're, if we're hungry to serve God, right? I know people who've been hungry to serve God and they've run off to serve God, and I know they've sown very little and they've never tithed. I think, well, you didn't lay a foundation there. Eh? You, you just got it. We've got to lay foundations. We've got a soul to the spirit and not to the flesh. Amen. So the heart is very, very key. It says to the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbeliever, nothing is pure. So it would be possible, I'm not suggesting anybody here, please hear me, to sit and listen to a message like this and, and just think, oh yeah, 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 it's like one of them TV preachers, once you money. That's a defiled heart, that's a, a dirty heart. To the pure, all things are pure. And it's like our heart has to be in it. That, you see, there's a difference between obedience to the word of God and just compliance. Well, I, I'll, I'll give into the collection because I feel I have to, because what will other people think? And I can. No, that's not an obedient heart. An obedient heart is a heart that owns it. Owns it. Now, 
There's examples in the Bible where people give with a wrong heart. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, He says, He said, Woe to you. Say, Woe. Come on, let's wake up. Say, Woe. 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 He said, Woe to you, you Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you give tithes, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law justice, righteousness, mercy, and faith. Those you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So he said, Look, tithe, but don't neglect justice, mercy, and faith. Okay, and we had time we could unpack when, when, when um, Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. There was the, um, the, the, the situation with the king of Sodom, and he wouldn't take anything from the guy. I'm not even taking a shoe latch it from you, lest you say you made Abraham rich. No, and Abraham was completely righteous in his finances. Then he tithed the Melchizedek, didn't he? He could have got, yeah, I'll get all this stuff off the king of Sodom. Then he could have given a tithe off that. No, he was righteous with it. Okay? And um, you might know the story. When, when, when that Pharisee guy, he goes before God and he says, Hey God, I'm a good guy. I'm not like this publican over here. This sinner, I fast two days a week and I tithe of everything I've got and I'm good. And he walks away not right before God. And it's so the Bible's very clear that our heart has to be right in these things. You know, I mean, for instance, like fasting's brilliant. But not fasting so I'm a spiritually elite. No, fasting, real fasting humbles you. It humbles you, man. It shows you. It deals with issues on the inside of you because Mr. Flesh comes up. Hello. If you never, uh, if you never met your flesh yet, really, just fast for three days. You'll be introduced to a person, <laughs> lovely person. Yeah. If you're married as well, do it together. It's even more fun. <laughs> Have a five-day fast, husband and wife. <laughs> See if you can avoid getting grumpy with one another. <laughs> oh, get down, get down. No, I can't get you down. I'm fasting so I can get you out. You get this flesh cast out and crucified. <laughs> oh. Fasting humbles and tithing, right, is humility. Because if that guy says, look, I tithe of everything I possess. No, mate, you don't possess anything. Because it all belongs to God. But you know, tithing is an act of worship. And you know, at heart is surrender and it's trusting God. I'm speaking as a father of four, right? And a father of foes, I'm watching my kids grow up. I mean, I'm saying to my oldest daughter, like, you, you, you're getting older by, you, you're growing up more by the week, it's scary. And you, you think about your kids' future and what you want to provide for them. And if I wanted to stop and think about it, I'm not posting, but if you, if you give a tithe of your gross income and you look back over the past few years, you could think, goodness me, that could have been a sizable little mistake, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, am I the only one who would tall this? I could have, could have had some trips to Walt Disney World with the kids. <laughs> yeah. So I was being honest. Sorry, Lord, I'll repent later. You know, but it, it's an act of humility. I'm saying, look, I, I trust you, not just for me, for them. And the, it's it's like I'm allowing my heart to be cut in that area, and see, it's investing in the future because in heaven there's a bank account where no moth, no rust can touch okay you know it says in Hebrews 7 8 it says here mortal men receives tithes but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives this was 30 40 years into the New Testament era after Pentecost right this is Christians tithing. It's not telling them not to. Who is receiving the tithes? Ultimately, who receives it? Jesus. That's what the Bible says. It says, yeah, men might receive the material. It goes to the work of the Lord, so on. We could talk about that. But ultimately, there he receives them, of whom it is witness that 
He lives. Who lives? Who's risen from the dead? Jesus. Who's receiving tithes? So is it wrong to tithe? Is Jesus receiving tithes? So, if Jesus receives our tithe, is He going to just let you be broke and let you be, your life be a mess? No. You know, if you give anything, to Je- does Jesus need your tithe? No. He doesn't need it. Is he broke? No. Does he need a handout? No. Things up there looking a bit, you know, the economy's not looking so good. Why does Jesus take it? Because we need to give it. Yeah. Why? Because we need to surrender this area of our life. There's no other area of our life shows surrender. John Wesley said, you know, Jesus, when, Je- when Jesus is the Lord of our wallet, he's the Lord of our life. And to surrender that, I tell you. And I might look back and at times I could think, I could have had a few trips to Disney World with the kids by now. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. But I'm more interested in the next 5, 10, 20 years that Jesus is the Lord of all of this part of my life or he's not Lord at all. And then I can live my life and I've got no fear, I've got no anxiety, I've got no worry. And I've still got, oh, I've got a holiday to pay off. Oh, oh, I've got to pay that off by Monday. I've taken the kids away for a couple of days. Still here on a Sunday. Though. And um, I've got an MOT to pay for. I don't know where that's. You just... You, you, kinda, you don't live stupid, but you live by faith, yeah? Amen. Amen. Now, it says that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what? Right. Giving with the right heart. Giving with the right heart means it's an act of worship. It is holy. It is sacred. I tell you, I thank God for people who give to Jesus ultimately in this ministry. Thank God for you. And we pray. We pray. Okay? Every penny that people give online or that goes in those books is, is holy to the Lord. It is holy and sacred. I fear God. Now, I just say at the last place we were meeting one time, we had the collection buckets and our kids started playing with them. Now they're just kids. Something rose up on the inside of me. That's holy. Kids don't touch it. Not to be played with. And I said something though. Don't ever touch those buckets. Please kids, don't do it. Because the kids, they don't understand. I'm, I'm not going to have my little kids pass the buckets around. No, they're not cute. They're passing the buckets around. No, they don't understand the gravity of it. This is holy. Okay? And, you know, we've got checks and balances in place. Right? So, if there's anything that's going to sink the ministry, it's going to be money, sex, or power. Right? We've got checks and balances in place so that it's accountable, right? We have a, a, a chartered accountant does our accounts and so on. And if there's so much of you know, John and Magdalene count up the collection, if what we count before we bang it, if there's a discrepancy, we pay the balance, right? If there's 10, oh, they, they've collect, uh, they counted up that much, there's 10 pounds missing, comes from us. Because it's holy to the Lord. It's so sacred. I believe people, I've heard stories of pastors fiddling tithes and stuff like that. I wouldn't want to stand before God. Oh, goodness me. Oh, dear me, that's rough. So it's an act of worship. Now, the basis for our giving. 2 Corinthians 9 is talking about giving with a cheerful heart. Your heart is in your giving. Now, the basis for our giving, if you rewind to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, it says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. It's in the Bible. Oh, it just means spiritual wealth. No, it is in the context of giving. It is. It just is. We can't get out of it. If you read the passage, it is in the context of giving. So when we give, we give because we are trusting in the finished works of the cross. It's not like we're trying to pay God back. Well, you give your only son, so I'll give this. No. It's, it's, you can't be free and put your heart in your giving unless you absolutely trust in the extravagant nature of God to give. I mean, he didn't just give an angel. He gave the best that heaven has. He gave his only begotten son. If he's going to go to that trouble to give his only son to be made sin for us, cursed for us, to be poor for us so that we can become rich, then I can trust him to give. I can trust him to give. He who did not spare his only son but delivered him up for us all, how much more will he freely give us all things? It's all based on our trust in giving. It's an act of trust. I've heard the story, I've shared it, where 
The guy walking across the tightrope over Niagara Falls pushing a wheelbarrow. Everyone's impressed. He says, who believes I could push a man in this wheelbarrow? And everyone goes, yeah. He says, you. Points at one man. Get in the barrow. <laughs> well, this is a get in the barrow thing. It's just this. When, we get see- when I was a young Christian, I didn't. I didn't take it seriously. Right? When I was at university, and I, I, I knew it, I was in a church at the time, and I, there was another brother in that church at uni, and, it, and he just gave like he, he tithe off his stu- off, off everything, and I didn't. I, said, I, I don't have no man. I'm a student. I just whatever, and I wish I had of, because his heart was more pure, right? And it wasn't until later that you get the revelation and you get the right teaching from the Word. So look, if God give his son right he sowed a big seed didn't he if God the father sowed his son has he reaped sons and daughters yeah. amen, amen. Come on. has he reaped sons and daughters yeah. is his harvest complete yet no. his harvest isn't yet complete is it he's still reaping amen. and when the last one comes in boom and we will see him descending on the clouds hallelujah we can sing that song so even God he sowed the biggest seed you could sow and he didn't reap an immediate harvest he still hasn't reaped his full harvest yet and every one of us here is a son or a daughter of God is a result of Jesus' life like a corn of wheat falling into the ground okay and we are the harvest from that seed. The Bible says, do not be weary while doing good. This is Galatians 6 again. And this is in the context, this passage of financial giving. If you read it, Galatians 6. Do not be weary in, in, in well, do not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Say, we, I'm going to reap. I have a due season. I have a due season. But I'm not going to lose heart. You see, God is able to make all grace, all favor, and earthly blessing come to us. He's able, the potential is there. But that potential needs to be released, and it's released through seed. By that's, that is God's economy. That's God's system of working. It's not works. There's the book of Galatians, that chapter 6, saying, Do not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. You see Galatians 2, Galatians 3, it's all grace, 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 grace. We can kind of think, well, grace, lots of people believe in grace whose lives are a complete mess. Total, utter mess. And they listen to more grace, more grace, and their lives are still a mess. This is God's grace way of living. You want to live Babylon's way and get on in life, you've got to fight. You've got to climb that ladder, you've got to elbow other people out of the way. In God's kingdom, there's enough blessing for everyone. No one needs to be envious of anybody. Nobody needs to compete with anybody. We can all just bless one another, celebrate one another's success. When someone's getting promoted in success and you haven't seen it yet, celebrate it, man, because yours is coming. If you don't lose heart, and this is an English issue, the heart, the heart, the cynicism, the unbelief. It's kind of like, you know, when I give then, nothing changed with me. Well, the heart was a problem. Jesus watches our giving. He watches it. You know, the woman who, you know, all the rich people were giving out their abundance and they were doing it to look flash. In front of everyone, like shed loads, bag loads of money. Like, look at me, everyone. Get this on camera. Paparazzi there. Look how much I'm giving. King. I remember years ago when I first got saved, I just helped out with this homeless shelter in Newcastle. Twice a week, on a night time, under an old railway bridge, feeding the homeless, helping people, loving poor people. And then they had a Christmas party, and the local MP came along, and he had his Santa outfit on. And he just looked like he was working really hard in front of the cameras. I and the guy didn't give a stuff about any of them. 
he came once a year for his photo opportunity because the, the local newspaper took his picture and in the paper there's this man looking really caring and charitable because I, I give the guy a left home afterwards I don't know why he didn't bring his car a, a local councillor MP quite an important guy and he was like oh I need to stop you I need a bottle he, he wanted a bottle of scotch or something like that you could tell the guy was totally about himself he didn't care it's just like a oh, paparazzi. It's like that's what these people are like. Look at me, how much I've done. My act of charity, charity. <laughs> you know? But there's a widow giving all she had, and Jesus said, "Look, he watched her. Jesus noticed. He said she is given. He saw the heart. Say the heart. The heart. Was her heart in her given? <coughs> now we might read that story, right?" and think, well, that, that silly woman, she gave in all she had. Now, from what we've learned so far in Scripture, I know Jesus doesn't tell Ken in the rest of the story of that lady. Do you believe that God would have worked in that lady's life? Yeah? Do you think God the Father would have saw her go without? No way. No way. Because he wouldn't have been true to his own word. He would have made himself a liar. God's not a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. In 2 Corinthians 8, there's a story about the Macedonian churches, right? And it says, out of great trial and affliction, out of, they had an abundance of joy, these givers, out of their deep poverty. These were people in deep poverty. And they gave and gave and gave. It's there in scripture. Now we read that in a kind of oh, romanticized poverty. Who knows? Do you believe God would have worked in their lives? If God's true to his word, do you think they'd stay poor? No. He just wouldn't. Because you know, poverty is romanticized. I was in a church once and there, for a long time people were always talking about like St. Francis. And, oh, I love the miracles and stuff like that. But you know, and, and they're in a, what they called back then in the Middle Ages, they romanticized poverty. Lady poverty. They call the how beautiful it is to be poor. And I'm in this church and they're doing this play on lady poverty. And all these Christians, oh, let's be poor. All Christians from really high educated middle class backgrounds. <laughs> Not Christians who are actually from poor backgrounds, right? They've got more sense. But all these highly educated, idealistic, silly airheads from middle class, highly educated backgrounds. We should be poor. And they're singing about the benefits of poverty. Think I'm, I'm, I'm really sure a, a little kiddie in Calcutta right now who lives on the streets of Calcutta would not be impressed with what you're doing right now. It's an insult. It's not blessed. It's not good. It's not God's will. These people were poor, but who knows they wouldn't stay poor. If God's true to His word, would they stay poor? Amen. We're going to finish soon. Historically, right, after World War II, South Korea was one of the most broken countries in the world. And then there was a war, the Korean War, between North and South. And what is now South Korea was one of the most broken, poor places on planet Earth, right? But the church came alive, right? And this is what happened. The church prayed and they give. They prayed and they give. Even today, churches in South Korea are renowned for thousands of people praying from 4 a.m. in the morning. They are prayer mountain. Right? They have the biggest churches in the world. And you know, today, South Korea has the highest income per capita in the world. It's got one of the strongest economies on the planet. It's one of the wealthiest places. Because the church changed the nation. It went from broken, complete poverty. They prayed and they gave. And all this, right, it's all the heart. Who knows that? It says in Proverbs 13 that the wealth of the sinner, the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. And someone did some research, right? And out of all the 7 billion people on earth, and, and it was calculated how much wealth there is in the whole world. If all of the wealth in the world was distributed to every person on earth, we would all have 10 million dollars. 10 million US dollars. So who knows 
There's a lot of wealth out there in the hands of the wicked that's stored up for the righteous. Now we are positionally the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm saying, I'm not saying just to rev people up. I'm saying, biblically, for every one of us here, there is a portion out there stored up for you. God hides things for us, not from us. But our hearts have to be entrusted with it. Okay? We have to come to a place where God can start to trust us. Okay? Because God's will is that we prosper and be in health. Now, I've had on my heart, to, I've said I'm going to preach on finances. Is this a good message? Is this biblical? Amen. Right? Now, we're going to take an offering now. And anyone even listening to this message, when we were in Miami, Florida, they, they took the offerings after the message. They never took an offering before the message. And, it, and, and I thought it was amazing, because the Word of God comes into you. Right? Who's received the Word of God today? Right? You've received the Word of God. So the Word of God came into me in those meetings and I sold into that Word. Because there's not a collection. And anyone listening to this, anyone listening online could think, Oh, well this is great. Hey, you have to just... No. If anyone in that way was to feel like that, please don't give. Please don't. But we're going to take an offering now in the name of Jesus. This is holy before the Lord. We're just going to pass these round. Okay, we have given envelopes. If you are a UK taxpayer, please fill in your gift aid details so we can claim tax back. Right? This is holy, holy, holy to the Lord. Lord, we worship you with our giving. We worship you with our offering in Jesus' name. God wants to prosper every single person here in Jesus' name. Thank you, my Father. God's will is that we prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. Who believes that? Amen. Say, God wants to prosper me and keep me in health, even as my soul prospers. And this today is my tithe, my offering to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. God is good. He's all the time. So Father, we receive this. This is holy to the Lord. And we declare, thank you my brother, we declare in the name of Jesus, this is seed. We declare seed be multiplied back to every person in this house in Jesus' name. We declare that poverty is broken. We declare, if, if you just want... Just this, just put your hands up right now. I declare new opportunities, new promotions in the name of Jesus. New promotions, new opportunities in Jesus' name. I thank you, my Father, that you're increasing us, you're expanding us. I thank you, Father. Guys, this is stuff we've got to kind of increase our trajectory, if you like. Because the Lord's saying, look, in a year's time or so, you've got to start having faith for a building, okay? You can't just go into a mortgage and get get one and get loads of debt and then people are giving tithes and offerings to pay off debt. No. You've got to, we've got to stop. As a church, we're increasing in every way. We're going to increase financially. We're going to take ground and take dominion. And that's in our lives. In our lives. In our lives. And there's wholesomeness in our lives. I thank you, Father, for complete shalom. Just say, thank you, Father. I receive your shalom. In Jesus' name. Nothing missing. Nothing lacking. Nothing broken. Hallelujah. God is good. Let's give him a praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So who's going to be here next week for the next part? Amen. It's going to be good? Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to throw this out just before I finish. I know God, my wife will tell me I've got to be careful. I talk too much. In the Bible, the Lord says, test me on this, right? And I'll say to anyone listening, right? And this is from the heart, right? I, honestly, I say these things and I'll go home and say, oh, do people think this? Do people think that? We were having a chat with me and Greg. If anyone puts a tithe in here, in this church, if you've never tithed, and you start tithing, if by September, let's say September, you say no change in your life, we'll give you your tithe back with 10% on top. Amen. Okay? 
So you need to keep, if anyone, if, if you know, if someone comes up, you have to just come over, come over, put this in there, yeah. The record I've given, 7%, right, and if someone's tied, and by September, no change, no breakthrough, we'll give you it back with 10% on top. Okay? The word of God, Malachi says, test me, and there's Malachi's no problem. We'll look at that next week, okay? Right? It is, right? Okay. So there you go. That's our heart. We're putting ourselves on the line, okay? Okay? Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God.